Welcome to the New Books Network. Hello, and welcome to the New Books Network. My name is Katie Coldiron, and I'm based at Florida International University in Miami, Florida. And I have the pleasure to be interviewing today Joseph M. Thompson, author of Cold War Country, How Nashville's Music Grow and the Pentagon Created the Sound of American Patriotism, released this year from the University of North Carolina Press. Joseph M. Thompson is Assistant Professor of History at Mississippi State University. Welcome to the podcast, Joseph. Thank you so much, Katie. I, I really appreciate you having me on. Absolutely. So what I like to do with these podcasts is start by asking the author a bit about the origin story of, of the book in question. So if you wouldn't mind, uh, could you tell us a little bit about how this book came to be? Yeah, sure. So um, I would say that it starts uh, a long, long time ago, if we're speaking at a kind of meta level, which is um, growing up where I did and when I did, um, I was I became really interested in sort of figuring out uh, when people allow or accept the federal government into their lives and when they reject it. I, I grew up in a tiny, tiny town in North Alabama, uh, but it was fairly close to Huntsville. And so I was surrounded by a lot of evidence of defense spending. I knew people who worked at Redstone Arsenal. I knew people who worked uh, for defense contractors in Huntsville. Many of them were engineers that worked for places like, you know, Raytheon and Northrop Grumman and this kind of thing. Um, and and I say uh, where I did and when I did because I grew up in the 1980s and 90s um, when there was a strain of conservatism that was really growing at the time that uh, em embraced this kind of small government ethos, right? That government was not the solution to your problem, or it, it was the problem, excuse me. Um, and so I, I became kind of fascinated when I, I began seeing people sort of have this, what to me looked like a paradox, right? It was okay for them to accept certain types of of, of federal spending or certain types of jobs into their community, but but were resistance to other other forms of the federal government in their lives, um, and so this was this kind of became an animating intellectual question to figure out um, again what seemed to be sort of a paradox to me. Um, now I, I uh, went to the University of Alabama, uh, majoring in American Studies and Anthropology, and then I, I went on. A got a master's at the University of Mississippi in something called Southern Studies, another interdisciplinary program. Um, and then finally landed at the University of Virginia for my PhD in U.S. history. And so I come from a, uh, a interdisciplinary background and a, ba a background very much focused on cultural history. So as a cultural historian by training, um, I started to use those methodology methodologies to really try to answer what is uh, kind of a political question, um, but again, using uh, trying to answer this through cultural history, uh, history methodologies, um, and particularly uh, investigating ideas about music, which is what I uh, tend to write about the most. Um, and you can't write about music in American history without talking about race. And so now we've got this conglomeration of race, politics, and music all hitting at the same time. Um, in fact, uh, um, a as I entered graduate school and began really learning the political history of, you know, post-World War II defense spending in the U.S. South, it struck me that historians had generally neglected to investigate how defense spending had impacted the culture of the region. And I found that, uh, I found that to be a, a bit frustrating. So I wanted to investigate, again, this, this intersection of culture, race, and politics in hopes of answering that, that initial animating question about uh, how is it that, that the people interact with their federal government. Um, now, that's, that's a lot about kind of the, the meta level. But to get into the particularities, there were, there were two archival finds that really put me on the path of this topic. Um, one was uh, had to do with the uh, attempted... Uh, kidnapping and assault on Nat King Cole uh, in 1956 in Birmingham, Alabama. I became fascinated with this topic uh, when I was uh, uh, doing my uh, graduate work at the University of Virginia. I went down to Anniston, Alabama, uh, which is where some of the attackers 
um, were, were based and started digging into some, some of the archives, the local archives there at the Anniston Public Library. I began reading their newsletter, which is called The Southerner. Uh, this was the newsletter of the North Alabama White Citizens Council. And, you know, uh, there were a lot of things I expected to find in a publication like that, like, uh, you know, railing against uh, black music, which is what, you know, they why they wanted to attack Nat King Cole. They saw this as this, you know, uh, this bad influence on the direction of America's youth. Um, and of course, they were up in arms over school desegregation at the time. Again, this is 1956. But then the thing that kind of surprised me and got me thinking again about that animating question was that they were railing against the uh, integration happening on their on the military installation close to Anniston, which was Fort McClellan. It's still there. Um, and Fort McClellan was interesting because obviously this is uh, 1956. So on paper, the military has been integrated for eight years at that point. Uh, following a, a executive order by President Truman in 1948, um, but but they're uh, they're particularly upset to know that men, white men and black men, are fraternizing, socializing in these intimate spaces where they're living and working. Uh, so they're, this local military installation becomes this kind of island of integration. If that's not bad enough, Fort McClellan is also the headquarters of the Women's Army Corps the wax. So not only are there black men and white men integrating, but there are black men and white women. And this is kind of enraging their white supremacist imagination. So this was, again, another one of those intersections of race, politics, um, and, and music all happening right there in, in Anniston. Um, so that was one that, that, that kind of said, you know, maybe there's something to this topic. Um, the other archival find was when I was doing a, uh, some initial research on a black country music singer named Obi McClinton. Now, Obi McClinton was um, a singer from Senatobia, Mississippi. He had um, written some R&B hits in the 1960s for Otis Redding and James Carr. Um, and then he uh, joins the Air Force in 1966. And while he's in the Air Force, He's stationed on Okinawa, and he discovers his talent and love for country music. So when he gets out of the Air Force, he decides to, to try his hand at a country music career. He has a moderately successful career, uh, particularly in the 1970s, uh, which was all a fascinating story. I, I found it interesting that there was this you know, other guy besides Charlie Pride uh, that, that most people know about who was a black man in the country music industry. That was all well and good and interesting. Um, but what was, what was really fascinating to me was that when he got out of the Air Force, he starts making uh, recordings for a radio, country music radio recruitment show sponsored by the U.S. Air Force called Country Music Time. And so when I found this out, my, you know, uh, I, a kind of light bulb went off and I was like, wait, there are country music radio recruitment shows? I, I want to know more about this. And that led me down the, the rabbit hole that essentially became... Uh, my book and a, a central theme of my book, which is that connection between uh, defense spending and, and the Nashville uh, country music industry. A really fascinating origin story with all these different threads that come together. Uh, so thank you so much for sharing that. Yeah. So getting into the meat of the book, uh, in chapter one, you introduce the reader to a very important figure for the rest of the story you tell, uh, specifically Connie B. Gay. Who was Gay and what role did he play in the process of what you term country music militarization? Yeah, uh, Connie Gay is um, a really under-recognized and under-appreciated person, I think, in country music history. Um, and he's really important to my story for a couple of reasons. First, he's he's a pivotal figure um, in the establishment and really professionalization of what we think of as a country music industry. Um, and, and second, he's one of the people responsible for the creation of country music recruitment radio programs. Um, this is a guy who came of age in the Great Depression. He's from a tiny town in North Carolina called Lizard Lick, North Carolina which is just fun to say. Um, and he found a way out of poverty by pursuing an agricultural degree at North Carolina State. Uh, 
And while he's there, he's also working as a part-time radio announcer and a, and a, a announcer for local bands. Well, in 1941, he went to work for the Farm Security Administration, uh, a New Deal program that's you know designed to, to better the living and working conditions of, of farmers. And at the FSA, he combines his agricultural education with his radio experience. So he figures out that you know rather than drive around the state, kind of going door to door essentially or farm to farm, promoting New Deal programs like the, the Farm Tenancy Act or what have you, um, Gabe began broadcasting to farmers from radio stations in from a radio station in Charlotte to spread what he called the the virtues of the New Deal. This was a guy who really believed in harnessing the power of the federal government and harnessing the power of mass communications to promote his interests. Now, in the 1940s, that's the New Deal. Uh, that's who he's working for. But in by the, gradually by the 1950s, the late 40s and getting into the 50s, uh, he's not so interested in promoting the New Deal. He's interested in promoting Connie Gay and country music. Um, so uh, in the mid-1940s, he began, uh, he moves to Washington, D.C., and he began delivering agricultural news on a program called the Farm and Home Hour. Um, and he notices uh, something that really kind of sparks his interest while he's doing this. He notices that if uh, the, the orchestra that they have playing music for the show, that if it has what he calls a rural flavor, uh, that they get a big response from their listening audience. But if they play just kind of light classical music or what have you, there's, there's no real response to the music. So this gives him this idea. Um, in 1946, he convinces the owners of a radio station in Arlington, Virginia, W-A-R-L, uh, to let him serve as an announcer. And he says that he'll work on commission if they let him play what he wants. Um, and what does he want to play? He wants to play country music, uh, or at that time called hillbilly music. So he starts playing hillbilly music, and it's immediately a hit with the listeners. Um, you got to remember, this is we're right after the war, so there's been this influx of rural to urban migrants from uh, surrounding rural areas, places in Virginia, North Carolina, Maryland, what have you, all to the D.C. area, many of them working for the defense state. Um, so then once he, he kind of starts uh, realizing that this is a real uh, promising business venture, he sets on a campaign to kind of elevate the reputation of the music and in conjunction with that, make it more profitable. So, uh, for instance, he, he begins something called Hillbilly Cruises, in which he rents a yacht, the, the SS Mount Vernon, to sail up and down the Potomac with hillbilly bands playing on board, which sounds, you know, pretty banging, to be honest with you. Um, and he also books Constitution Hall, uh, which is owned and operated by the Daughters of the American Revolution, the DAR. Uh, he books it initially for a one-night stand in 1947, and that becomes a weekly concert for him beginning in 1948. Uh, and again, this is, this is pretty interesting because he's kind of, uh, once again, elevating the reputation and elevating the profile of country music, making it more respectable. Uh, in fact, when he books the, the Constitution Hall, he doesn't call it hillbilly music. He calls it folk music, uh, even though it's the same, same bands that would have been on his hillbilly cruises. Um, and this causes a kind of uh, somewhat of a, a stir around Washington, D.C., because uh, the Constitution Hall was supposed to be this place that hosted, you know, classical music, opera, what have you. And so it was a bit scandalous at the time that these hillbillies were going to come in and, you know, I don't know, tear up the seats or track cow manure into the Constitution Hall or whatever people were imagining was going to happen. Um, and he'll really kind of continue uh, with this strategy the rest of his career as he builds a stable of country music talent that he manages. And that includes people that you probably have heard of, people like Jimmy Dean. Uh, if you haven't listened to his music, maybe you know his breakfast sandwiches and sausages. Uh, or Roy Clark from Hee Haw or the Stoneman family. Um, so he, he's managing this, stable, this kind of growing stable of country music talent. He also buys several radio and television stations around the country, which is extremely profitable for him. And he becomes the founding president of the Country Music Association in 1958. Um, so that's a little bit about him and how he gets his uh, foothold in the country music industry. But you, 
You specifically asked about uh, his relationship to country music militarization. Um, now, this term or this phrase, I should say, is something that I use throughout the book to kind of, uh, it's a kind of a catch-all term to talk about this reciprocal relationship between the Defense Department and the genre of country. Um, and it's supposed to emphasize how the U.S. military influence the business and politics of the country music industry. And it, it, I, I use it as a kind of shorthand here to describe these personal, economic, and symbolic connections between the genre. Uh, that, you know, it, it, this genre that's usually associated with, uh, with the White South and Southwest, uh, and to, to really show its connection to the Cold War defense state that delivered a, a, a financial uh, boon to those regions. And so if we're talking about country music militarization, Connie Gay is absolutely key here uh, because he recognizes that, you know, connecting the artists that he's promoting and his radio stations in the D.C. area to the U.S. military could accomplish a couple of things at once. Uh, it could fulfill a kind of Cold War patriotic duty and it could help promote his business interests there in D.C., um, and the, the kind of key example for this and, and the, the real spark to, to Connie Gay's uh, country music militarization is when he books Grandpa Jones on a tour of Japan and South Korea in March 1951, where they supposedly play for around 38,000 U.S. and U.N. troops. Now, while he's there, uh, Connie Gay is recording messages to be played on, to, on his radio stations back home, uh, promoting WARL as this, you know, um, especially patriotic radio station. And, <clears throat> excuse me, a, a radio station that actually cares about what's going on with the troops in Korea. Um, you know, and he's even interviewing soldiers who are from the D.C., uh, area and saying, you know, when you get back home, be sure and tell your tell your folks that WARL was here uh, on the front lines of Korea with you. Um, and this tour with Grandpa Jones uh, really creates a kind of model for his business. He begins booking tours all over the world, uh, in the Pacific, the Caribbean, uh, all around Europe, uh, for his uh, the country music artists that he's managing. So in Connie Gay, you have this kind of embodiment of country music militarization, someone who represented those personal, economic, and symbolic connections. Um, and he's only going to continue this when he begins lending his radio shows uh, to the U.S. Army and Air Force Recruitment Service uh, in the early 1950s. Um, now, I do want to say that Connie Gay was not the first, and Grandpa Jones were not the first country music um, artists and, and managers to tour U.S. bases uh, or, or tour for U.S. soldiers. Uh, Roy Acuff and members of the, of the Grand Ole Opry cast um, uh, would tour uh, installations and, and play performances for soldiers going back to World War II. Uh, Roy Acuff, in fact, you know, kind of rivaled Frank Sinatra's popularity amongst soldiers in World War II, according to some accounts. Uh, but Connie Gay is important because he's the first one to really see the commercial potential here. Thanks so much for that and really interesting figure. So in chapter two, you talk about the merging of military recruitment and country music in the 1950s, specifically through highlighting talent within the military's ranks and promoting country music through outlets under the umbrella of the Armed Forces Recruiting Service or AFRS. Could you tell us a bit more about this and the type or demographically of recruits that were sought after in this era? Yeah, so um, to begin talking about, <coughs> excuse me, um, to begin talking about uh, radio recruitment and, and country music recruitment specifically in the 50s, um, I got to begin with talking about a guy named Farron Young that a lot of country music fans will be familiar with. I, Katie, I don't know if you... Uh, were uh, a fair and young listener. But um, this is a guy who will go on to be a Hall of Fame member, have tons of number ones uh, and huge hits in the, in the 1950s and 60s. Um, but when he enters my story, he, he's not there yet. Uh, he's kind of an up-and-coming country music performer uh, 
who's just starting to get a foothold in the industry, just starting to be able to perform on the Grand Ole Opry. He had gotten a, gotten a start in, uh, in his native Shreveport, Louisiana, on the Louisiana Hayride radio show. He gets a sort of promotion up to the Grand Ole Opry uh, in 1952. And then, you know, as luck would have it, he's drafted in November 1952. Um, and this kind of feels like a, a devastating moment for Farron Young. He thinks, oh, you know, essentially what is going to happen to this fledgling career? I was just about to get off the ground. Well, uh, his luck begins to turn around a bit in early uh, 1953 when a, a song he had recorded before entering the service uh, gets a top 10 hit for him. It's called Going Steady and, and it hits uh, in the top 10 in January 1953. Now, at this point, he was stationed at Fort Jackson, South Carolina, for basic training. And the, the commanding officers there kind of realized that, you know, what they have on their hands here. Uh, we've got a, this up-and-coming, country, promising country music star. Now, at the time, in, in the early to mid-50s, there's all kinds of recruitment shows on radio and television promoting uh, armed service as a, as a career path for people. Um, and one of those shows is a, is a program called Talent Patrol, which was hosted by Steve Allen. And it's a kind of American Idol sort of talent, soft talent competition. Uh, but with Talent Patrol, all the participants were active service members. And so this was supposed to double, uh, you know, as entertainment and recruitment at the same time. Well, he goes, uh, Farron Young enters uh, the, the Talent Patrol contest and wins. Um, and from there on, he goes on the road as an entertainer and recruiter. Uh, he's playing concerts all over the South. He's playing the Grand Ole Opry. Uh, he's playing Connie Gay's shows, all spreading the message of, you know, this is Farron Young playing for you, uh, and I'm sponsored by the U.S. Army. So, again, he becomes the kind of spokesperson for, for the Army in that way. Um, and as for the type of people that they're hoping to connect with here and, and recruit, there's a couple of answers to that. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, on, the, on the one hand, the military just needs bodies, right? Uh, and so, as I, as I mentioned earlier, the, the recruiting service is casting a, a really wide net in the 1950s. They're embedding their messages everywhere. Young men, and to some degree, young women, uh, are, are looking for entertainment. So, you know, think your, your sports magazines, um, you know, popular mechanics, boys' life, this kind of stuff, uh, embedding recruiting messages in there. Um, but if, if they could really choose and not just say, we'll take anybody, the, the U.S. Army in particular and the U.S. Air Force would want a slightly more educated army, or at least recruits with goals of upward mobility. Now, this is a, uh, an army that is really um, advancing uh, technologically at the time towards more sophisticated weaponry, nuclear weaponry, this kind of thing, uh, much more technologically advanced as compared to earlier generations. So education is important, or at least recruits that, um, that aspire to some kind of education. Now, the other part of that is that they want to keep a pipeline of young men from the Southeast flowing. Um, the recruits now the recruiters are have have seen that you know there seems to be this kind of pipeline coming in to the military from uh, recruits in the southeast and they think well why don't we keep that pipeline moving they seem to like country music let's give them more of that now uh, this is not to say that there is a kind of conspiracy amongst the defense department in some way to try to say oh we're you know country music is is psyops and we're going to somehow you know brainwash people into joining our, our service it's not like that at all uh, not at least in my uh my uh research that i found it's it's just more a kind of a, a marriage of convenience i think thanks so much for that and to answer your question about Farron and Young, I know who that is from my grandparents. So, All right. uh, yes, one of many <laughs> connections to my own upbringing in Kentucky, which which brought me to this book and away from my normal Latin America <laughs> programming. Yeah. So, moving on uh, to chapter three, you focus on the city of Memphis, Tennessee, specifically its role in the continuing relationship between the military and country music, as well as the burgeoning genres of rock and rockabilly. Additionally, this is also the chapter when 
when you begin to discuss in more detail the relationship between country music and genres more closely associated with African Americans. Could you tell us a bit more about these phenomena? So for folks who are expecting a book solely focused on Nashville, um, chapters three and four could seem like a detour where we spend a lot of time in Memphis, but there's a couple of reasons for that. So uh, one reason is simply a, a methodological reason. It gives me a kind of social history of soldier musicians. Uh, one of my archival bases was located at the Smithsonian uh, uh, National American History Museum, and there they have a lot of oral history transcripts with the, uh, with the kind of archetypes, or excuse me, the architects of uh, rockabilly. And so reading their interviews I, I was kind of overwhelmed with this pattern of stories I found in the archives of these Memphis musicians who were eventually going to get tagged as rock and roll or rockabilly, but they all started out as aspiring country musicians. Um, and so many of them started out in one way or another by playing while in the armed services. Now, maybe that meant using the talent they already had to kind of land a, a, a sweet gig in the special services playing uh, music as an entertainer for other soldiers um, but for many of them military service gave them the time to practice and kind of hone their skills um, i write about the the military as a sort of incubator for creativity in this way and here i'm talking about some some kind of household names that people will know. Johnny Cash, Scotty Moore, Charlie Rich, uh, Sonny Burgess, Conway Twitty. I mean, it, it goes on and on and on. Uh, in fact, I would say one of, the, one of the challenges of writing this book was being able to, to tell all those stories without getting too repetitive because it was just overwhelming how, how this, this pattern developed for these, for these guys. Um, so yeah, it, it, it allowed them to sort of be able to have the time to sit around and play their guitar and write songs with with other people and it also gave them a space to absorb influences or even collaborate across the color line um, and they bring those influences back with them to memphis where they pioneer this new sound in country music that reveals their indebtedness to black music and style so i think it's it's kind of key and and sort of uh, reconstructing the the context on the ground in Memphis that these guys weren't setting out to you know um, invent rock and roll they were all aspiring country musicians and had all had this kind of uh, uh, woodshedding time while serving in the military it's also a chance to highlight some of the inequalities of the music business and show how the military echoed those patterns um, and so here we're getting into to some of the African-American musicians that you uh, referenced in the question here. So people like Wynton Kelly, who's a jazz pianist, Clyde McFadder, who people might know from the Drifters. Um, a lot of, there's a lot of, uh, <coughs> excuse me, African-American musicians who are performing while in the service. Um, but the way that I interpret that is that this was generally seen as a kind of interruption to their music careers and did not serve as a, as a springboard into greater success that a lot of the white musicians uh, found. In other words, they weren't, um, you know, put on recruiting shows uh, that, that then allowed them to boost their profiles. Eventually, the, the Army and Air Force will use um, black music in their recruitment, but that's going to be a later story. That's a, that's a 1970s story. When, you, when we go back to the 50s and 60s, it just was uh, not, not in their, uh, their experiences. Thanks so much for that. So uh, Chapter 4, which... Um as you reference, builds a lot off chapter three. You focus on the career of Elvis Presley, whose career was very publicly shaped by his military service. Specifically, what was the impact of Elvis's stint in the military on his own career and vice versa? Yeah. Um, yeah, you know, you, you can't write about this subject without writing about Elvis Presley, even though, to be honest with you, I tried in my... Um, editor and uh, my dissertation advisor said no you can't you can't do that you got to have Elvis so first we should understand Presley as a kind of prime candidate for military service uh, he had joined the ROTC while he was a 
a high school student at Humes High School in Memphis. He even worked in the summer at a uh, at a factory called Precision Tools uh, that had a defense contract during the Korean War, and so he was actually making ammunition casings uh, in the summer while he was still in high school. So I give that sort of background information to say, you know, maybe he would have landed in the military uh, like a lot of other Southern white guys as a path to stable employment had he not turned into, you know, to the biggest star of the world that, that he became. Um, and so you do have to uh, then retrace his sort of meteoric rise to say that was the path he got to go on rather than pursue this uh, defense employment path until he can no longer uh, avoid the draft. He gets a lot of, uh, it gets several deferments because he's filming uh, some of his first movies and because he's got to fulfill recording contract obligations. But finally by 1958 he can't dodge it anymore and he finally gets drafted and he essentially kind of disappears for a couple of years. Um, and this surprises some people. And I, I, I think it surprises them because there is this tradition of using entertainers at this point, entertainers who have uh, you know, uh, uh, some success to either use them in a special services entertainment capacity or as a, a spokesperson for recruitment. And Elvis gets none of that. And the reason is, you know, special services say they don't want him. The recruiting service says they don't want him. Uh, and that's for a couple of reasons. One is that uh, he's seen as too rebellious, number one. You know, we have, to, we have to remember that this is the dangerous, sexy, uh, threatening Elvis, not the, you know, the, the kind of caricature of himself that he would uh, become at times. Uh, he's seen as dangerous, rebellious, a leader of a sort of uh, mortal, moral revolution at the time. Uh, so that's one thing. The other thing is that, uh, that special services at least says, you know, his, his biggest appeal seems to be amongst young women. And that's not a demographic that we really care about. So we don't want him. Um, now, this was seen by many of his fans as something that was extraordinary. Uh, in fact, you know, I, I, I start out the chapter with a kind of famous letter from three young women in Montana saying, you know, please don't take Elvis Presley uh, and give him a GI haircut, you know, that that's going to break their hearts. Uh, and that's just one sample of many letters who, that were written to President Eisenhower and written to, you know, different military installations saying, you know, please, please don't take our, uh, you know, our heartthrob here. Um, and so they see it as just, you know, beyond the imagination that the U.S. Army would essentially steal away uh, Elvis Presley from them. But in, in coming up with an argument to make about Presley here, I'm, I'm arguing that it was anything but extraordinary. In fact, it was very, very ordinary. Um, and, and that's why that previous context about him being in the ROTC and about working for the defense state in one way or another is important here. Um, also, it, it's often talked about as a kind of death knell for Presley's career, um, as if, you know, that, that was kind of the, the end of the real Elvis, the authentic Elvis. Sometimes that's the way it's pitched. Um, but, uh, but the Army did for him what it really promised to do for a lot of recruits, and that was essentially to kind of turn you into a real man and set you on this path for greater success and your civilian uh, career of, of your choice. And that's exactly what happens for Elvis, right? He does become a, uh, a, a greater success, at least monetarily, commercially, uh, after the war. Um, and also, he is um, cleaned up. A sanitized version of Elvis reemerges. And for some people, that's, you know, that's the kind of uh, a detriment to, to Elvis. But at, at the same time, I think we have to look at it in, in terms of this, um, this kind of ideas about Cold War military duty, and he, it turned him into a man, right? Uh, and this is especially illustrated in the, the 1960 film G.I. Blues, um, in which, you know, the, when the opening credits come on the screen, audiences learn that Paramount Pictures had produced the film with the cooperation of the U.S. Army and the Department of Defense. Uh, and so this is a radical change over two years, not just for Elvis, but for the army itself to say, 
um, you know, where where once we thought this guy was this, you know, uh, a threat to the morality of American youth and only appealed to young women. We didn't re really want anything to do with him. Uh, now we can use him and put him in this film, GI Blues, which was essentially, you know, a, a, a long recruitment film. Thanks so much for that. So in chapter five, you present the Country Music Association, or CMA, and its efforts to convert country music into a genre with worldwide appeal, all in the shadow of such phenomena as shocking realizations of the continued level of racial segregation in the military, despite the 1948 executive order by Harry Truman that you referenced earlier that desegregated the military. <clears throat> Could you expand a bit more on this era and the continuing relationship between military, the military and country music? Sure. Um, yeah, you know, it, it's it's interesting because as I got into the 1960s, I began to see how the racial integration policies of the military and the commercial ambitions of the country industry, particularly the, the CMA, uh, inadvertently set country music and the military at cross purposes. And I'll, I'll ex try to explain what I mean uh, by that. Um, so in the early 1960s, uh, at, at the in the beginning years of the Kennedy administration, um, there is this growing concern about uh, racial inequality within the military. In fact, uh, Defense Secretary Robert McNamara establishes something called the President's Committee on Equal Opportunity in the Armed Forces in 1962, um, and this becomes known as the Gassell Committee, uh, named after its, its chairman Gerhard Gassell. Uh, and they were investigating a, a few different problems that they saw with, with race in the military. Uh, they're, they're seeing low enlistment rates amongst African Americans. Uh, they're, they're seeing charges of racial violence between service members. And they're seeing uh, charges of discrimination and ill treatment that was experienced by black soldiers um, when they, whenever they entered the civilian communities around their installations. Uh, and so they go in and they, they start begin investigating these racial problems. And what they find, one of the one of the things that they identify as the problem, particularly with low enlistment rates, is that there aren't uh, recruitment messages specifically targeting African Americans the way that they are targeting uh, white Americans. Uh, and so they, they say, you know, you, you've got low enlistment rates amongst black Americans. You've got low uh, rates of uh, the, the African Americans who do join, not as many of them uh, gain a kind of uh, gain officer status as, as uh, happens at the rates of, of white soldiers and sailors. So this is a, a problem if we're wanting to create a military that looks and functions like the democracy that uh, that we're aspiring to be, particularly in the Cold War, as you know, the U.S. is trying to sort of combat uh, propaganda about race relations that's being used by the Soviet Union at this time to say, you know, uh, a capitalist democracy is is full of inequalities like this. So there there are these uh, investments at the federal level to try to make the military a more equitable place uh, in terms of race race relations. Uh, and that's all well and good, and, and they do succeed in making some advances in that regard. But at the same time, the Army and Air Force are really doubling down on country music recruitment. Uh, for instance, the, Arm, the, the, excuse me, the Air Force creates uh, their show Country Music Time in 1961, and it's going to run until 1986. So for 25 years, you could hear, turn on your radio at, at some point and hear a 15-minute recruitment spot featuring live country music performances. Um, also, the, the AFRTS, the uh, Armed Forces Radio and Television Service, began responding to what they were hearing as an uh, increase in demand for country music on their airwaves. And this is particularly coming from uh, listeners in Europe. And so they increased the amount of country music on the air in 1961 by 35%. So it's pretty likely that at some point during the day when you turned on your radio, if you're stationed in Europe and you turn to the AFRTS network, uh, you're going to be hearing some, some country music during that time. So the point is that even as the Kennedy administration is trying to increase black representation in the military and do away with discrimination, you know, country music is making the culture 
of military life as something designated for whites by using this genre of music that is so heavily dominated by white artists and fans. Now, again, I'm not saying that only white people listen and, and listen to and make country music. I'm not saying that by any means. But in the imaginations of these, uh, the people who are creating these policies and playlists, uh, it is white music. Um, and the CMA, the Country Music Association, is happy to capitalize on this increase in demand uh, for country music and the, the kind of uh, the, the increase of country music on the AFRTS. They began, uh, the CMA, I should say, was founded in 1958 as a kind of uh, chamber of commerce, quote unquote, uh, for country music to promote its image and business interests. Uh, and they began pushing more and more country music on air for these uh, service members. Uh, for instance, one of the founding members of the CMA starts a show called Country Corner. This guy's name is Joe Allison. Not only was he a, uh, a founding member of the CMA, he's also the sort of pioneer for country format radio. So the fact that you can turn on the, the station, or excuse me, turn on your radio today and hear a radio station that is all country music all day long, that's Joe Allison's creation. Um, also, AFRTS policy uh, began prohibiting the use of derogatory descriptions of, of country music on the air, uh, which I love this detail when I came across it, right? You couldn't uh, refer to it as, as hick music or music from the sticks or hillbilly music, right? Uh, the, these, these terms that were seen as derogatory towards country listeners. You could call it country, country and western or simply the music of America, uh, which speaks a lot to the themes of my book, I think. Um, and here's the, here's the real uh, kicker for uh, the CMA and for, for the country industry. Because of all that country music being pushed on the, on the air um, in the 1960s through the AFRTS, there was this, this increased exposure leads to increased record sales. So by 1968, almost 70% of the records sold in the European military stores, the PXs, are country music records. Uh, and so that's an extraordinary statistic to think about how much country music is being listened to and purchased by uh, service members. Thanks so much for that. So uh, in chapter six, you bring to the forefront what is arguably the climactic point in your narrative of the relationship between the U.S. government and the country music industry, the Vietnam War. Specifically, you show that while country music continued to be promoted among the ranks as a safer alternative to the more popular counterculture genres, you reference the Beatles quite a bit here, um, of the 1960s, this did not necessarily imply universal support for the war from country music artists, either privately or in their musical output. Could you expand a bit more on the Vietnam era and the relationship between country music artists and the U.S. government during this time? Yeah, sure. Um, you know, when, when I talk about country music being uh, or becoming the sound of American patriotism, um, it's often understood that I'm talking about songs like, you know, Merle Haggard's Okie from Muskogee or The Fight Inside of Me, these stereotypical backlash anthems that are associated with a very narrow definition of patriotism uh, that's tied to this sort of unflinching uh, support for the military no matter what, right? Uh, if you don't love it, leave it, essentially, is that sentiment. In fact, that's a line from Fight Inside of Me by Merle Haggard. However, um, and as you suggest, there's, um, there's, that's really only a small sampling of country music. And one of the goals of the book is to expand how we hear country music in the Vietnam era. So even songs like Hello Vietnam, which people may know from the opening credits, credits of Full Metal Jacket, uh, this was a song recorded by Johnny Wright uh, that says, you know, uh, that uh, it's essentially a letter saying, you know, uh, goodbye, my sweetheart. Hello, Vietnam. I I'm going off to war to do my duty. Uh, another another song that, that gets kind of used as, as a caricature of country music in the Vietnam era is Tell Them What We're Fighting For, which is written as a soldier is writing a letter, as if a soldier is writing a letter to his mother. 
saying, you know, those protesters and all those pro those uh, students in the peace movement, they don't understand what we're doing. You know, we have a, a, a job to do. We have a duty to to fulfill here and just tell them what we're fighting for. Right. It, this must just be a misunderstanding. Um, and so when I'm writing about those songs, I, I suggest that they shouldn't be heard as outright endorsements of the war itself, but instead should be heard as something much more subtle. Uh, and that is individual soldiers struggling with the idea of what it means to go to war at all. Um, and it's interesting, both of those songs are written by a, a key figure in my book, a guy named Tom T. Hall, who's also from Kentucky. Um, and he, he, not only does he write those two songs from this first person perspective, uh, trying, trying to give voice to a soldier who's expressing their trepidation about war. He also writes what I think is one of the most powerful anti-war songs of the era or any era. Uh, and that's Mama Bake a Pie, Daddy Kill a Chicken. And uh, despite the kind of, you know, uh, interesting name, I encourage listeners to go right now and, and listen to it. It's one of the most powerful songs uh, ever written about the experiences of war and dealing with its aftermath. It's written from the perspective of, of a soldier who's been wounded. Uh, he's lost the use of his legs. He's being shipped home in a wheelchair and he has to face all the questions from, you know, the, the flight attendants, uh, from, from people on the airplane, from people in his family saying, you know, Oh, you know, thanks so much. We really appreciate what you did. And in his mind, he's thinking, you have no idea what I went through. Uh, he's, he's got to face the fact that his uh, girlfriend is likely going to leave him because he can't, you know, f be the, the figure that she needs him to be because he's now he's paralyzed. And so he ends up by the by the end of the song, you understand that not only does he have this kind of isolation because of his war experiences, but he's also self-medicating. He's got a bottle hidden under the blanket in his wheelchair and, and he's, he's kind of drinking away the pain. And this is getting played on country radio, right? So when we think about what country music means at the time, we, we, we need to understand that there's this broad range of perspectives being used here uh, or being expressed here. And that's something that I think listeners can appreciate about country music that yes it, there are these kind of rah rah jingoistic anthems from people like Merle Haggard and we could we could talk about whether those are even you know legitimate from his perspective or not um, but there are these kind of jingoistic backlash anthems uh, and at the same time there are these much more subtle uh, expressions of dissent uh, I think we can hear hear them as that. So, so really when I'm talking about country music being wedded to this cheerleading for the U.S. military, I'm talking about the country music industry itself and Music Row as a, as a business institution that found a really lucrative partner in the armed forces. And so we shouldn't lump all these individual artists under that classification. Really powerful argument. Thank you for that. So in chapter seven, you transition to what you call a, what it becomes a more symbolic relationship between country music and the U.S. military, specifically due to such phenomena as the end of the, the draft and doing away with previous structures in the name of financial austerity. What do you mean by a symbolic relationship between the U.S. military and country artists and which artists most exemplified this new relationship? Yeah. So uh, before talking about the, the uh, symbolic connection, I, I do want to t talk about the, um, the, these drastic changes that are happening um, because I think that's key. That's a kind of, those are the key contexts uh, needed to understand the symbolic relationship that emerges. So first, the, the first element that you, you mentioned is the end of the draft. So Nixon ends the draft in January 1973, and ever since then we've had an all-volunteer force, right? Uh, this marks a, the beginning of a drastic demographic shift for the, uh, for the U.S. military. So we're getting, you get more uh, minorities joining, more women joining. Um, in fact, by 1980, a third of the U.S. Army is African American. That's a drastic uptick. Uh, so in, in the post-civil rights and, and post- Vietnam years, there's a recognition that 
the uh, if we're going to have an all volunteer force, then the military needs to cast a wider net. Uh, that's important to the musical story here because they start creating soul music recruitment programs. Uh, and th now I should say these are different than the country music uh, recruitment shows. Um, and here we have to think about the production of these. So when they're creating soul music recruitment shows and even rock and roll recruitment shows, they're just taking album cuts and putting them together and then uh, inserting a, a message about recruiting or, or about uh, joining the military in one way or another, one branch or another. Um, that's very different than, than most of the country music programs would, in which the country music artists would actually go to a studio and record live versions and interact with the recruiter as if they are, you know, they are invested in this. That's a very different from a production value. But still, uh, the point is they're creating these, these soul music recruitment programs because they represent, rep recognize the need to cast this wider net. Also, the, the relationship between Nashville and the AFRTS and the PX has changed at this point. So due to budget cuts, there's a kind of consolidation and homogenization happening in both the uh, AFRTS and the PX. Um, the AFRTS begins using uh, syndicated shows, uh, many of them pre-recorded. They also start using automated uh, machines rather than live DJs. Um, and so the uh, Armed Forces radio starts to sound a lot more like civilian radio than it did a kind of uh, particular listening experience made for service members. Uh, back, If you go back to the 50s and 60s and listen to those shows, um, there it, it a lot of them are locally produced by DJs who are serving in the military. And so they're able to sort of, um, you know, um, craft a show that highlights the interest of the people that they know on the ground. They're also able to uh, bring in live performances by other service members. That's going to go away by the 1970s and into the 80s when we get these more syndicated shows. Um, so due to these, yeah, all, all this is to say that, that country music is still involved uh, with the AFRTS and the PX, but they don't have the active kind of purchase and militarization that it once did. Um, of course, following the, the loss in Vietnam, there's a general drawdown of troop numbers and not so much of a need for the same kind of readiness that there was for 20 years up to that point. Um, and I, th I also think it's important to note that the country music industry did not really need the military as it once did. Um, it was country music had become cool by the mid 1970s. You have the outlaw movement. You have the uh, by the by the early 80s. You're going to have the urban cowboy trend. Uh, you're going to have a lot of success with crossover artists like Dolly Parton and Kenny Rogers. Um, so the country music didn't necessarily need the kind of helping hand from Uncle Sam that it, that it once did. So even as they maintained this connection to the military, it was often about honoring a very generic idea of patriotism that America, and, and this idea of American heritage and country music's place within that rather than patriotism through military service per se. Now, of course, that's going to change in around 1984 with the release of Lee Greenwood's Proud to be an American, uh, which, you know, everyone probably knows and has, has heard at one point in their life. Um, and when we can talk about uh, <laughs> Lee Greenwood, if, if you would like, but, uh, but even that is a kind of symbolic of honoring military service because in, uh, he writes that song uh, in after an attack on a Korean airliner uh, by a Soviet airplane, downs a, Korean, a South Korean airliner. There are United States citizens on board that plane. Um, and he expected President Reagan to uh, respond with the full power of the American military. He thought World War III was at hand. And so he writes, proud to be an American, uh, God bless the USA, um, in anticipation of a war that never came. Um, and so when, at this point, he's got this, this, you know, what he hears as a real banging song um, and a patriotic song, but no war for it to, to cheer on. 
And so that's what I mean by it comes, a, it becomes a kind of, uh, symbolic patriotism associated with this idea of, of military service, but there's no war to, to cheer on just yet. It's absolutely fascinating and leads into my next question for you concerning the introductions and the conclusions of this work, um, specifically where you highlight the continuation of the symbolic relationship between the U.S. military and country music. And you reference artists that more people, I think, would um, know immediately uh, without an insane amount of familiarity with country music, people like the Chicks, formerly the Dixie Chicks. Toby Keith and uh, Jason Aldean. So I wanted to ask you, in your view, why has this symbolic relationship persisted and how has it changed or stayed the same? Yeah. Um, so I, I hope that what the, those portions of the book, the introduction and conclusion, <coughs> excuse me, what the, I hope that what, what the introduction and conclusion show uh, is that certain country artists feel an obligation to support the military for reasons that even they may not fully understand. Um, now, th this is really going to become evident during the War on Terror, as you suggest, with the kind of rivalry between Toby Keith and, and the Chicks. Um, I think that there's a kind of cultural inertia that carries people into political affiliations. Um, so you, I, you know, I have these quotes in the introduction from people like Aaron Tippin and Daryl Worley who were saying, you know, um, this was, they were interviewed during the, the beginning years of the war on terror saying, you know, we're the cheerleaders. This is what we're, this is what country music does. We, we speak for this, uh, political outlook. We speak for support of the troops. Now, I'm not saying that country musicians should or should not uh, support the military or the politicians who are backing, you know, defense spending. You know, that that's up to them uh, and, and really none of my business. However, I, I think um, what I hope the book does is to give people, and, and I mean fans and country music industry people alike, uh, I hope it gives them a new way to think about the context of those political decisions, right? That it's not just inertia that's carrying people into these affiliations between a genre and a particular outlook on the world, uh, but it's something that, that's been cultivated over, you know, at this point, 75 years of a, of a relationship between uh, between the Defense Department and the country music industry in one way or another. And I think it's a chance to think about how culture, and here I mean music, can create these associations between race and certain political positions or even certain governmental institutions. Now, um, again, this is not to say that country music is only liked or played by white people. I'm speaking to you on a day in which Beyonce released a country music al album of, of you know, some sort or another. Um, but there is this historical construction of music, of country music as that, as a genre for white artists and fans. So hopefully country music, or Cold War country, will give people some understanding of how this Cold War militarization helped build country music industry's politics. Um, so this kind of hawkish conservatism that's associated with the genre didn't just spring fully formed from the silent majority in 1969, uh, and it didn't come from just this handful of songs, be it Okie from Muskogee or Proud to be an American or, you know, Toby Keith's um, uh, The Angry American, right? Um, I think the expectation for country music in the present to be patriotic in this, this normative sense of supporting the military has has stayed the same and i think there's a kind of continuity there because of these historical precedents that I, that i've written about um however i i do think that it's changing uh and you mentioned jason aldean and i do end the book with with him and him selling shirts that say military lives matter and and i do i do a little bit of thinking about what that means and and what what that could um uh, why he would choose to, to sell a shirt like that. Uh, so I, I do think it, that country music militarization is changing in part because the nature of U.S. Uh, military intervention is changing. Uh, 
Um, also, the, this political position that's been really that's been associated with conservatism and the Republican Party, in which it is the the kind of uh, sector of politics that most vehemently supports military intervention and backs the troops as as part of a kind of party identification, right? I think we're seeing that change under the control of Donald Trump, uh, a man who doesn't show the same deference to the U.S. military as his predecessors. Um, so under him, it, it seems to me that patriotism is getting rebranded, uh, not as loyalty to institutions like the U.S. Armed Forces, uh, but loyalty to you know this specific, specific vision of, of making America great again. Um, so you get artists like Jason Aldean who are recording songs, voicing these nostalgic visions of the American, uh, American past, coupled with calls for vigilantism that, that sit really well with this backlash to, to Black Lives Matter and the January 6th raid on the, on the Capitol building. Definitely a lot to think about. So I like to conclude these interviews by asking the author a little bit about what they're working on. So if you have any current projects you'd like to share, uh, we'd love to hear about them. Yeah, thank you. Um, I, have a, I have a couple of uh, small projects that are I'm trying to figure out which, which one is going to be the next big project, or if they're both going to be two new uh, big projects. One is about the New Orleans-based... Uh, pianist and music producer Alan Toussaint, who makes a brief appearance in Cold War Country, actually, uh, because he, he played some piano while serving in the U.S. Army in Texas. Uh, but I've been fascinated with him for, for many years now, uh, primarily as a fan. Uh, but I want to understand where he comes from and how he fits into the sort of piano traditions uh, that come out of New Orleans and how I could perhaps link the... the uh, the connection between those piano traditions and the Caribbean and kind of flows of labor and culture between New Orleans and, uh, and places like Cuba. So Katie, I should probably talk to you about that in more in depth. Um, so that's one project. The other is, um, I've recently written a short piece about themes of the lost cause in country music. And I've been developing, uh, a kind of, outline for a potential long project, another book project about that. So that would start in the, around the turn of the century when Lost Cause memorialization really gets going and then kind of jumps to a mid-century moment where um, people are, are re-interested in the Civil War based around the, an the centennial anniversary of the war and then jump to a kind of 70s, 80s moment and think about how country rock uses Lost Cause um, symbols and, and ideas so that's a, that's that would keep a foot in the country music history but uh I, I would also i would also really like to pursue that new orleans project too well i think i speak for all the listeners when i say those sound like really great projects we look forward to seeing uh, this has been cold war country how nashville's music grow in the pentagon created the sound of american patriotism by joseph m thompson thank you so much again for for being with us today joseph Thanks a lot, Katie. I appreciate you reading the book and the, and the great questions. Absolutely.